It is a late autumn day in rural southern Lake County, Indiana. The tree leaves are full in color and beginning to fall. The big puffy white clouds rolling off Lake Michigan are powered by a northerly wind and foretell the coming of winter. The gentle rolling hills of a rural countryside belly, the fact that it is less than 30 miles from the dirty red dust and noise of the still mills of Gary and Hammond, Indiana. A small tree-lined stream runs along the base of the rolling hills, separating the grassy hills from the dusty, narrow country lane and the field of tall brown corn waiting to be harvested on the opposite side of the creek. An older, two-story farmhouse surrounded by shade trees can be seen in the distance between two of the green hills. Birds abruptly take flight from the trees along the creek when startled by a horse and rider slowly following the tree line. The horse and rider continue their leisurely gait, undisturbed by the rush of wings. The rider is dressed in a pair of faded jeans, western boots, a brown denim work jacket, and a short-crowned western hat, making his, him look like he had just ridden out of an old cigarette commercial. The only interest of the rider is to watch the big clouds to his right rise and change shape as they come inland from the effects of the cold water of Lake Michigan and over the warmer farm fields. Seemingly lost in his thoughts, the rider lets the mare pick her route of travel. She stays close to the trees. The only sounds are those of birds in flight and the horse's hooves in the fallen leaves and twigs. As the horse slows to step over a limb of a downed tree, the crack of a high-powered rifle is heard to the rider's left, shattering the serenity of the scene and startling the burrs from the trees. The horse flinches backward and shies to her right away from the sound. The rider drops the reins and clutches the left side of his chest. He rolls backward off the horse, which indistinctively bolts away from the sound, then stops, realizing it has no rider. From the cornfield across the creek, the dry leaves of the corn rustle, and a male figure carrying a scoped, large-caliber rifle cautiously emerges. He is dressed in a pair of jeans, an old brown leather jacket, no hat, and a pair of brown loafers. His eyes are glued on the body of the rider, now lying motionless in the grass. The figure slowly makes his way to the creek bank and cautiously scrutinizes the fallen rider through the rifle's high-magnified scope, trying to determine the damage caused by his bullet. Looking at the cold water and his loafers, he decides he does not want to wade across this creek. Resting the rifle against a tree, he lines up a headshot through the scope. The rifle goes off. The recoil causes it to bounce up and away from the tree as the head of the downed rider jerks with the impact of the second round, scattering human debris in the fallen leaves and grass. At the sound of the second shot, the horse bolts and heads back down the distance building. Satisfied with his second shot, the shooter turns and hurriedly disappears back into the cornfield. The sound of a vehicle engine starts, and out of the cornfield emerges an older model blue Chevy Blazer. Knocking down the unpicked corn, it finds its way to the gravel lane and speeds away from the scene, raising a cloud of dust, liberating the Blazer. The following morning in Indianapolis, on the third floor of the Indiana State Office Building, Major Kenneth Queen of the Indiana State Police knocks on the door of Superintendent Sheldon Johnson and enters without further announcement or invitation. Shelt, Major Queen announces emphatically, we had another murder in Lake County last night. So what's new? Looking up from the piles of paper, Superintendent Johnson asked, was it someone we know? Queen replies, no, just a part-time plumber and full-time thief. He's been a long-time suspect in vehicle thefts in Lake County. What makes this murder unique is the victim was riding his daughter's horse and was shot out of the saddle with a high-powered rifle, just like in a John Wayne movie. How many murders does that make related to car thefts up there now? I'm not sure. I've lost track, but I think that's 27 in the last three years. Have you heard any word from the FBI about our request for grant money for an undercover operation up there? We should hear shortly. Who do you have in mind to run the operation? It's going to be a bad job for anyone we send up there. Our best cover people are tied up on other assignments right now, but I'll volunteer someone if we get the grant. Are you going to send the same people that work the sting at New Albany? I don't think so. One is working a gambling case in Anderson. The other is working involved in a drug case in Evansville. We have an undercover drug officer that just finished up a good drug investigation here in Indy. I'd like to give him a try. Has he ever bought hot cars? Well, No. Do you have someone in mind with some car savvy that can help him? 
Well, not exactly. I have one or two in mind, but neither one has an undercover experience. Who are they? One is Dave Mayer. He knows cars inside and out, but he's having some back problems and may need surgery in the immediate future. I was considering shields and vehicle theft. I think you worked with him at one point, but he's had no UC experience. Shields is the best shot in the investigation section, which could be important up there for in-house protection and is in pretty good shape physically. That's right. I saw him knock a horse down with his fist. Of course he was mad at the time, and the horse had just knocked him down, rolled over, and stepped in the middle of his back getting up. For in-house protection, he's the best. For working in vehicle theft, he's the best qualified. But will that override his lack of undercover experience?